Welcome to DockerCon Live 2021. I'm thrilled to be here today presenting this talk on the Docker and Container Ecosystem 101. We are going to have a batch of new developers every year that are new to containers and to Docker. So um, my personal introduction was sink or swim. I found myself wading through a bunch of new terminology and I, I didn't understand um, several things found quite a few stumbling blocks that slowed me down, not to mention suffering some of those consequences of trial and error. So my goal for you is to have a good foundation before you jump into the deep end of containers. And I really like doing talks like this because it forces me to look back and remember what it was like for me. This is our agenda today. Uh, quick intro, and then I'll move right into a discussion of why one might want to get comfortable with containers today. Um, the history lesson portion is going to be the heaviest portion of this talk, so make sure you're in a comfortable spot um, where you can absorb this info, get yourself a drink, because it's going to come at you fast. I'll give a brief explanation of the Docker ecosystem, uh, some 101 terminology around containers, and then I'll just finish off with a few resources where you can go and learn more. Some background on me, very brief because I have a ton to share with you today. Um, I'm Melissa McKay. I just celebrated my first year anniversary with JFrog as a developer advocate. Prior to that, I was a developer and I have been for over 20 plus years, um, various levels, various uh, teams, uh, organizations. I'm a Java champion. I'm a Docker captain and you can find me at uh, on Twitter at Melissa J. McKay. I had so many questions. My introduction to Docker was by way of a project that was developed by a third party contractor. So in my case, this wasn't a decision that was made by my team at the time. The first time, the first thing that I saw when I was ramping up on the code base were Docker commands in the readme file and a file named Docker file in the root of the project. I'm always up for learning something new, so I was intrigued. I had no idea what this Docker thing was. This particular project that introduced me to Docker was already designed, code was already written and functional. So in this case, the best thing for me to do was just dive in and figure out how to set it up, build it, deploy it as it was. Uh, this strategy has worked well for me when ramping up on any project, especially when it involves new, new tech stack or framework. Um, just follow the instructions to get it up and running, make note of any difficulties or questions that come up and then go back through again, that's the important part, to understand how all of those pieces fit together more clearly. And that you're gonna have to do repeatedly until you get it. So right away I did have questions um, like these here, uh, but nothing stopping me from moving forward. So I learned best by doing. My first step was to download Docker Desktop and try this thing out. Before we get into Docker details specifically, let's ask the most important question, why would we or should we even use containers? I don't know why Docker was chosen for this particular project that I was tackling. I wasn't involved in those initial discussions, but as I worked with it and as I started setting up our dev environments and our CICD pipelines, I did see several advantages. If you are thinking of doing the same, wrapping up your applications in containers and going cloud native, take a moment to consider the problem specific to your project that you'd like to solve. Um, put these down in writing somewhere too. I see so much documentation out there that goes into depth on how to do things, but doesn't explain why very well. Um, so let's go through this list. These are just problems that you might be trying to solve. Um, number one, really you're using Java 11? This one is kind of a joke. Kind of. Java 11 was released in September of 2019, and Java 16 just came out recently. But I know so many projects that are, for various and legitimate reasons, still running on Java 8. I also know how frustrating it is to deploy a nice new Java 11 application to a prod machine that only has Java 8 installed. Number two, my workstation is a MacBook Pro. <laughs> I love my MacBook. Um, I'm not going to advertise for Mac, but um, how many of you have worked in code that has a bunch of if statements in it around what OS you have? I'm sure there are some legitimate reasons for this, and I'm remembering scars from the browser wars, but I had a situation once where a particular set of unit tests that I ran 
failed because I was on a Mac instead of Windows. There are multiple problems there to address, but it is nice to have the option to run unit tests in a container without having to worry about every possible OS. Uh, number three, there is a bug in production. Uh, the first step as a developer is to reproduce the problem, but that's very difficult to do if you're already developing the latest and greatest and you've made changes to your environment that are not backward compatible. Uh, consistency and build reproducibility are key when you're chasing bugs. Number four, it works on my machine, only on my machine. Uh, this is related to number two. Again, consistency in software versions and libraries will make your life a lot less complicated. Number five, we just hired three new developers. Uh, that consistency from step four will make onboarding team members a lot easier. Number six, my service is super popular. That's one of the biggest reasons for moving to uh, modularity and to containers, uh, utilizing the strategies of cloud native deployment uh, to quickly scale your application as needed. And on that note, uh, right away, I want to dispel the idea that a container is the same thing as a VM. This is a little bit of a simplistic explanation, but it works for what we're here for today. Um, think of a, a VM. A VM has its own OS, the entire OS, and therefore it's not as lightweight as a container, which actually shares the OS with, uh, of the host with other containers. So container use cases. If you're not currently using containers in production, there are other scenarios worth considering the use of containers in your development pipeline. Um, there's, you know, dev environments. Um, there's no need to suffer from that disappointment of spending an entire day debugging a problem that you find out only happens on your machine. For test environments, um, this is pretty convenient. Uh, having the ability to easily launch other external services so that you can make better use of your integration testing and um, you can definitely uh, improve automation in that area. And then of course your production environments, um, you will have less of a problem um, securing dedicated resources. Um, you may not have to wait for custom provisioning or uh, worry so much about inconsistency. All right, now I wanna get into a bit of history. Um, it's easy to skip this part when you're eager to get started, but I recommend going through this exercise with any new framework or te technology that you want to start using. Uh, this is quite a bit of info, so like I said earlier, uh, sit back and get comfortable, but bear with me, it's good stuff. Understanding how we got here and where the tool you're about to commit to for your project, where it came from, can help you avoid some nasty pitfalls, and it'll help you use the tool in the most effective way. Um, you know that popular cognitive bias, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, that is also applicable here. Containers are useful, but aren't intended to solve everything uh, yet anyway. <laughs> so here we begin. Um, timing is everything. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, computing resources were a lot more limited than today. Computers were commonly dedicated for long periods of time to a single task for a single user. Of course, uh, those limitations resulted in plenty of bottlenecks and just general inefficiency. Efforts were started to develop a method of sharing resources without getting in each other's way or having one person inadvertently cause an entire system to crash for all of its users. Both hardware and software that advanced virtualization technology started to trickle in. And one development in the software area was Chirrut, which is where we're gonna start. So in 1979, during the development of the seventh edition of Unix, Chirrut was developed and then later added to the Berkeley software distribution in 1982. This system command allowed for the ability to change the apparent root directory for a process and its children, uh, which results in a limited view of the file system in order to provide an environment for testing a different distribution, for example. Uh, Chirrut was a move in the direction of providing the isolation required from us today. And several years later in 2000, 
Uh, FreeBSD expanded the concept and introduced the more sophisticated jail command and utility in the FreeBSD 4.0 release. Its features that were later improved in the 5.1 and 7.2 releases, uh, those helped to further isolate file systems, users, and networks, and included the ability to assign an IP address to each jail. In 2004, Solaris Containers and Zones brought us ahead even further by giving an application full user process and file system space and also access to system hardware. Then Google jumped in with their process containers in 2006. Uh, they later renamed those to C groups, uh, which centered around isolating and limiting the resource usage of a process. Um, you saw those little Java arrows um, jump in there. Uh, this is directly related to that, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. In 2008, C groups were merged into the Linux kernel, which along with Linux namespaces led to IBM's development of Linux containers. And now things get even more interesting. Docker was open sourced in 2013. That same year, Google open sourced their Let Me Contain That For You project, and that provided applications the ability to create and manage their own subcontainers. And from here is where we saw the use of containers explode uh, Docker containers specifically. Initially, Docker used LXC as its default execution environment, but in 2014, Docker chose to swap out their use of the LXC toolset for launching containers with libcontainer, which was a native solution that was written in Go. I thought that was an interesting tidbit to learn. Soon after that, the um, Let Me Contain That For You project, they ceased act active development uh, with the intention of joining forces and migrating those core concepts to Docker's libcontainer. So they kind of teamed up on that. Lots more happened. Um, before we leave, I wanna point out again um, something specific that concerns Java applications. Um, Java 7 was released in July of 2011, Java 8, was released in March of 2014. So given the development that was going on in containerization at the time, um, it shouldn't come as a huge surprise that older versions of Java aren't fully container aware. Um, except it is a surprise. If you don't know this and you wrap your Java 8 application only to suffer from out of memory killer activity. Uh, the reason for this is because uh, the mechanisms that the JVM uses in these older versions to retrieve the resources available from the host, um, they come from the actual host machine and not from the C group limits that you would expect. So although possible with later Java 8 updates, um, it's recommended to get to Java 11, which is the first version that is truly container aware. There is a ton more that happened during this period of time, and I'm intentionally skipping over some details in order to get to a specific event in 2015. This event is important to know about because it gives you some insight into some of the activity and the motivations behind shifts in the market, especially concerning Docker. On June 22, 2015, the establishment of the Open Container Initiative was announced, and this is an organization under the Linux Foundation with the goal of creating open standards for container runtimes and image specification. Docker's a heavy contributor, but in their announcement of this new organization, it was said that over 20 organizations were involved in this effort. Um, this is a huge list of companies. Um, I just included them in here because I, uh, just to give you an idea of what a big deal this was. Uh, containerization evolved to such an extent that a number of organizations wanted to work towards some common ground for the benefit of all. The OCI accomplished some big things. Um, they produced three specifications so far. One, the OCI runtime specification, the image specification, and the distribution specification. In 2017, those uh, first two, the runtime and the image specs, were released as version 1.0. And then a few years later, actually just recently, uh, May 4th, 2021, the distribution spec 
was released. Um, I have more to say about the specs and Docker's place in them in a minute. It's pretty interesting. Just one month after the OCI was established, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, or the CNCF, was established. Uh, the CNCF does a lot. There are a ton of projects that are either incubating or graduated under its umbrella. Uh, it's grown a ton. There are a few activities that you need to know about just for our purposes. Um, they have to do with uh, Kubernetes. So along with the developments in the container ecosystem, orchestration was also in rapid development. Orchestration frameworks like Kubernetes took on the responsibilities of coordination, configuration, and the management of containers in deployment environments. Kubernetes version 1.0 was released at the same time the CNCF was announced. And Kubernetes was contributed by, contributed by Google, and was, that was the first project that uh, was brought into the CNCF. Right on the heels of that first release, uh, version 1.5 came out, which included the container runtime interface. And there's that word again, runtime. So what exactly is the CRI? Uh, the CRI is a level of extraction that allows the uh, Kubernetes to support alternative low-level container runtimes. Docker, the company, also a member of the CNCF, and well on their way to breaking up their huge tech stack we know, we know as Docker, uh, they contributed their CRI compatible runtime called Container D. You've probably heard that project before. Container D was developed in order to integrate Run C in uh, Docker version 1.11. I'll explain what Run C is in a minute. All right, you made it through that history lesson. I know that was a lot of stuff. My hope is that learning how everything came to be, you won't be so bogged down with all of the new um, project names, the spec names that you'll come across and you'll run into uh, when you start your Docker container journey. So Docker, the tech stack, does all of these things and it does it well. Um, defining a container, uh, building an image of a container, managing container images, distributing and sharing those container images, uh, that would be Docker Hub, right? Uh, creating a container environment, launching and running a container, that's the part that's the runtime, and then managing the life cycle of those container instances that you've launched. Uh, they do this well enough that it's uh, Docker's popularity is unmatched in this area. Note that when, uh, when you hear talk of container runtimes, though, um, or image formats, uh, what's being discussed is really a small piece of the whole package here. And container runtimes, they need a section all their own to talk about. We need to spend a little more time here because it can be confusing for someone new to the world of containers. The Docker tech stack contains a lot more than just the runtime. Uh, Docker did quite a bit of reorganizing their code base over the last few years, uh, developing abstractions and pulling out discrete functionality. One of the results of that effort was a project called Run C, which we just mentioned earlier, which was contributed to the OCI. This was the first and for some time the only implementation of a low-level container runtime that implemented the OCI runtime spec. There are other runtimes out there, um, but this is a very active space, so be sure to reference um, the current list that's maintained by the OCI for an up-to-date information on, on what projects are currently active. Uh, notable low-level runtime projects right now include uh, CRUN and implementation, implementation in C, led by Red Hat. Um, <laughs> it's a cute confusing name. <laughs> um, you have run C and at, and this one, C run. <laughs> and then Railcar. Uh, this is an implementation that uh, was in Rust that was led by Oracle. Um, that one has since been archived since the first time I looked at it, but it was interesting. Um, developing a spec 
like the OCI spec is really challenging and collaborating on the um, specification wasn't any less challenging, of course. Figuring out where the boundaries are, uh, what should and what should not be included in that spec uh, took some time before the release of version 1.0. It is clear, however, that just implementing the OCI runtime spec isn't enough to drive adoption of the implementation. Additional features are needed to make those low-level runtimes usable for developers. And since we're concerned with much more than just the creation and running of a container. This leads us to higher level runtimes like Containerd and Cryo. Uh, these runtimes include solutions for many of the other concerns uh, around container orchestration, including uh, image management and distribution. Um, both of these runtimes implement the CRI, which eases the path to a Kubernetes deployment. And both of these also delegate the low level container activities to OCI compliant low level runtimes like Run C. So Kubernetes uh, announced they are deprecating the Docker runtime after version 1.20. Um, this is nothing to panic about. And I, I put a link to a blog here. Um, in short, the deprecation of the Docker runtime support does not in any way, shape, or form mean that Docker is going anywhere or losing support in other ways. Uh, you can still use Docker to develop and produce Docker images and containers as you do now. Those images and containers are runnable by Kubernetes. It's just that um, Kubernetes no longer wants to do the work of, of supporting the entire tech stack. Um, they want to support uh, those, implement, those that implement the CRI. Note that Container D does implement the CRI, and Docker has used Container D as its runtime since version 1.11, which is old news because that's been out for a while. All right. Uh, let's just go through some simple terminology that your, your very first words you're going to learn uh, when you jump into working with containers. So container, it is a running instance on your machine. And we discussed a little bit earlier the difference between a container and a VM, for example. Um, you do not have to choose between containers and VMs. In fact, um, it is common use case to have containers running on VMs. All right, container image. This is an immutable, executable binary used to create a container. Um, it is the blueprint for that container. The Docker file is the file containing the image build instructions. That's how you create the image is using that Docker file. An image tag, that indicates the version of the image that you're working with. And a container registry, that is a library of container repositories and images. And an example of a public registry is Docker Hub. They also provide private registries and there are lots of other companies that provide private registry, registries as well, including JFrog and the cloud providers. Image repository, that stores all of the version tags of an image. So you have a container registry, it contains repositories, repositories contain images, and then uh, every version of that image is indicated with tags. All right, what now? What, what to do now? <laughs> uh, there's some helpful links here. You cannot go wrong with just going to Docker, um, downloading Docker Desktop. Um, it works very well on the Mac. Um, very beautiful interface. It, they've improved it quite a bit. Um, you have the ability to uh, view your images uh, through the UI rather than just command line. Um, you can look at logs for those images really easily. Um, if there's a port open, um, for example, like a web service or something, um, it's really easy to open that up and be able to, to check it, see if it's running. Um, 
their documentation that they have available on their site, also excellent. There's a really good getting, getting started guide that I would suggest to go through if you haven't already. Um, it's going to get you comfortable with all of the commands that you're going to need to build, um, launch, and run your containers. Um, also, you know, the organizations that we talked about, the CNCF and uh, the Open Containers is o the um, Open Container Initiative website. Um, those are good ones to browse through if you're curious what's going on late, you know, the latest and greatest in the world today. All right, that is it. I hope you have enough to get started, um, enough to feel brave and like this is something that you might want to try and uh, look into. Highly recommend it if you are working on a project that, um, you know, is intended to be uh, deployed to the cloud and um, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>